How and when did different nations and cultures arise? Today on Creation Magazine Live, we'll talk about the origin of the nations. Hi, my name is Calvin Smith. And I'm Richard Fangrad. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. This week we're going to talk about the origin of cultures and nations according to biblical history. Now, uh, in one of the episodes, season two uh, of Creation Magazine Live, uh, we dealt with when God created, yes. right? And if you missed it, you can watch it at our website at creation.com slash cml2-04. So Creation Magazine Live season two, uh, episode four. And in that episode, we, we summarized key evidences all supporting a recent creation. God created about 6,000 years ago, etc. Right, yeah. Now, for this week's program, we move forward in biblical history to the event of the world-destroying flood. And if we want to put dates on these things, we're going to talk about history. Right. That's a good thing to do. That was about 2350 B.C., somewhere right around there. Right. Now, obviously, all nations, if we're talking about the origin of nations here, the nations must have started after that. You had eight <laughs> right. people at the time of the flood who survived the flood, and then the nations came from there. Uh, the question is, are there secular records that confirm that biblical timescale? Right. And the answer is yes. Right. There are secular, lots of secular records. Uh, now, a key event in all of this was the Tower of Babel. In Genesis 10.25, we read about at the birth of Peleg, the birth of Peleg, in his days the earth was divided. We read there in Genesis 10.25. Now, recently some have suggested that this refers to the breakup of the physical earth. Right. But that would have been so catastrophic, it would have, it would have essentially been another global flood. Or it's destructive so, as a global flood, yes, anyway. very destructive. So uh, the word earth, when we're looking at uh, scripture here, we need to be careful how we're looking at this. The word earth, aretz, in the original Hebrew can have uh, uh, different meanings, like most words. Uh, and just like the English word earth. Now the traditional interpretation, and of course this is supported from uh, other verses, uh, we're going to look at those, is that the, um, this refers to the breakup of the people of the earth by language. Of course, at the Tower of Babel, God confused the languages. People groups couldn't speak to each other and then separated out or towards the earth. That's why God actually confused the languages yeah, because he told yeah. people to spread out over the earth. Um, so let's look at some of these verses. Uh, Genesis 11, 1 says, Now the whole earth had one language. Well, obviously, we're not talking about the earth. We're talking the, about the, the world, the, the people on the earth. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Genesis 11:9. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. So when we hear that the earth of that time, you know, was was uh, was broken up, um, we're, we're talking. We're not talking about uh, the actual dirt. We're talking about the peoples right. of the yeah. earth. So the breakup of uh, there there in Peleg's day as the Tower of Babel event. Right. Now, according to biblical chronology, as deducted by Archbishop Usher, the flood occurred 2349, 2348 BC, again, so some, somewhere right. in that time frame. Peleg was born, according to Archbishop Usher, in 2247 BC, about 100 years, uh, about 100 years later. Is there any confirmation about these dates from ancient writers? Absolutely, and we'll get to that in 60 seconds. According to skeptics, one of the characteristics of pseudoscientific theory is that it contradicts a known scientific law. For instance, in biology, we have the law of biogenesis, which states that life only comes from life. Ironically, though, many self-professed skeptics ignore this scientific law when it comes to the origin of life. According to evolutionary theory, all life on Earth can be traced back to a single-celled organism, which itself arose from non-living chemicals. But this is a clear contradiction of the law of biogenesis, and not surprising so far, scientists have been unable to validate this belief. Even Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for co-discovering the structure of DNA, admitted, an honest man, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. Well, maybe it was a miracle. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. 
Now, if you've just tuned in, we're talking about the origin of nations and the founding of those nations when they started. Uh, obviously, it started with people after the breakup of the, the dispersion from Babel after God confused the languages right. there. Now, if we start with the founding of Babylon, let's start there. The Tower of Babel was, was uh, likely in, in, on the outskirts of Babylon, that, right. that kind of thing. In 331 BC, after Alexander the Great had defeated Darius, he went to Babylon. There he received 1,903 years of astronomical observations from the Chaldeans, which they claimed dated back to the founding of Babylon. Now, if this was so, that would place the founding of Babylon in 2234 BC. That's about 13 years after the birth of Peleg. Right. And so that fits well with it actually them. actually fits very well. Yep. <laughs> and Porphyry, an ancient Greek, uh, an ancient, uh, an anti-Christian Greek, anti-Christian is what we're getting at, yeah. Greek philosopher, uh, he also deduced the same number. He, he, was, uh, he lived in the third century. Right, so here's great evidence that fits perfectly with the biblical uh, chronology. Yeah, with ec extra biblical sources. That's right. Uh, concerning the founding of Egypt. Uh, the Byzant Byzantine historian Manassas wrote that the Egyptian state lasted 1,663 years. If, if correct, then counting backwards from 526 BC when Egypt was conquered, it gives us the year of 2188 BC uh, for the founding of Egypt, which is about 60 years after the birth of Peleg. Um, about this time, Mizraim, the son of Ham, led his colony into Egypt. Hence, the Hebrew word uh, for Egypt is Mizraim. So yeah. here again, 60 years after Peleg, this completely makes sense. They move outwards from, uh, from the Tower of Babel right. and, and yep. they start establishing things and fits in with the chronology perfectly. And so the dates line up to after the birth of Peleg. Right. From these, these extra biblical sources, yep. the dates are lining up. They're supporting the biblical time frame. If we look at the, the founding of Greece, another ancient nation, we have records about the founding of Greece. According to the 4th century bishop and historian uh, Eusebius of Caesarea, the, the king of the Greek city of Sicyon, west of Corinth, began his reign 1,313 years before the first Olympiad, which was in 776 BC. That would mean that that, that king started to rule to, in, in 2089 BC. Right. And that's about 160 years after the birth of Peleg. So again, it's after the birth of Peleg, the time scale is right. Yep. This is all confirming the biblical record. All these dates go back to just after the birth of Pele. From some of the major civilizations that, yes, that we look at. Yes, those ancient civilizations. Yeah. And uh, it just confirms the accuracy of, of the Bible. Right. And of course there's more. Uh, note that Babylon, Egypt, and Greece each spoke a different language. Now these uh, ancient historians have uh, really kind of unwittingly confirmed that the Tower of Babel, uh, which was the origin of languages, must have occurred before the founding of these kingdoms, right? We had to have different languages be right at, at the Tower of Babel, and, and, and so if the different kingdoms had them, and they all take place very shortly after Peleg, well, that means, uh, right, we had to get those uh, languages somewhere. It all fits beautifully. Yeah, so Babel, Babylon being in the same region as the Tower would have been one of the earliest kingdoms, and the dates uh, fit this. And if you want more details on um, what we talked about so far, uh, you can just look up the article in the days of Peleg at creation.com slash Peleg. Right. More confirmation that all the nations uh, began after Babel comes from a study of the origin of languages. Uh, secular linguists are puzzled by the existence of about 20 or so language families in the world today. The languages within each family and, and the people who speak them are shown to be genetically related, but there are few links between the language families. Right. And this also supports uh, what we see there in Babel. Uh, this is a problem for secular linguists, though, because if speech evolved, and that's the, uh, we start with grunts and you go up from there and so on. If, if speech evolved from a common language, then you would expect that there would be links. Between, genetically. Genetically, yeah, links between all of the languages today that you could kind of trace the root words back to some sort of Right. Primitive proto-language that all languages came from. Right. That's if, not what we see. But if God supernaturally uh, gave different people groups different languages, then of course within that people group, that's where you're going to see the similarity in genetics. Um, okay, you know, this is, this is really remarkable when you think about it. This is exactly what we'd expect to find if, if various languages were, were supernaturally given, right? Um, the data is from, uh, from, from linguists. So we look at the, the uh, establishment of the different um, um, you know, 
cultures, kingdoms, I guess you could say. Yes, this from is, secular writings. To, we're, we're looking at the Bible and putting dates on those, on those events there based right. on biblical chronology and so on. Then we look at ancient writers and they confirm those dates. That's right. And we hear a lot from people trying to criticize the Bible uh, sometimes. So, well, you know, the Bible, it, it just, it just, you know, it's, yes. it, it doesn't, it's not supported by anything outside of the Bible. And of course, we want to start with the Bible. It's got the ultimate authority. There's no book on the planet that has more authority in the, than the Bible right. in your eyes, right. eyes or uh, CMI, etc. But uh, this claim that the Bible is just sitting on its own somewhere, it's just out in la-la land, doesn't connect to real history, archaeology, science, all those types of things. Uh, it just doesn't hold. Uh, the Bible's got great support from, you know, not only internally but uh, yes. externally and so, as well. And, and the way you said it was was good. I mean, we start with the Bible. It's our authority. Right. But we don't end there. I mean, it, it's it, it, what we believe is we want to be sure that what we're believing isn't some some fairy tale, some cunningly devised fable, as as Peter says. Right. But it's supported by other things, and that's what we've just done here in these first few minutes. We're looking at ancient writings and archaeology and so on also confirms that, and it supports what the Bible says. Our faith right. as Christians is not a blind faith. Yeah, we're not bubble people sitting out there saying, you know, <laughs> you know what I, mean? I mean, there's a lot of faith systems out there. For example, you know, if you wanted to say, well, I believe in reincarnation, say, okay, is All there right. any evidence from history, archaeology, science? How would I test that? Yeah, How would I test yeah. that I used to be, you know, a woman uh, a thousand years ago in <laughs> Greece, or something, you know what I mean? It, it's just, how, what, what kind of test could you put to that? What we're showing right. is that, look, you can put the scripture to the test, and, and guess what? It fits perfectly it with, what, uh, with what we see. We'll be back with more in a second. Genesis Verse by Verse is a Bible study tool available on CMI's website, designed to help pastors, students, and laymen alike study the book of Genesis like never before. And it's completely free. Simply look up any verse in Genesis 1-11 to or just scroll down the page. The center column provides links to articles that answer common questions pertaining to that verse and the topics that naturally arise from them. Visit creation.com to use it today. Okay, on this week's episode we're talking about ancient history, the, the founding of the oldest nations and the historical data that supports what the Bible says. Right. Right? Secular history gives a lot of evidence to show um, that the survivors of Noah's flood, they were real historic figures. This isn't just names that somebody scrawled down in some kind of uh, fairy tale somewhere. Uh, and, and actually that these historical figures, they were, they were a big part of the ancient world. Right? So if you have a Bible, you can open it to uh, Genesis 10. Uh, this chapter is what most people call the Table of Nations, right? right? And most Bibles also include a map. It look, kind of looks something like this. And uh, uh, the map shows the areas where um, most of the 16 grandsons of Noah moved in the years following Babel. So several things uh, happened here, right? Yes, yeah. And we can, uh, we can look at some things that happened there. Uh, people in various areas called themselves by the name of the man who was their common ancestor. We see that happening over and over again. They called their land and often their major city or, or a major river by his name. We see, see that happening as well. Sometimes the various nations fell off into ancestor worship and when that happened it was natural for them to name their god after the man who was their ancestor of all of them or to claim that their long living ancestor is their god. Right. So we, we see those kinds of things there. And, and what all of that means is that the, the evidence has been preserved in a way that can never be erased. It's recorded in history. Right. The ancient names of these, these different lands and the cities and rivers and so on, uh, we still have those today, or derivations of those today. Right. So we can look at a few examples here. We've already uh, mentioned one, uh, Mizraim. Yes. It's the Hebrew word for Egypt. Right? And the name Egypt appears hundreds of times in the Old Testament, um, and well, with one exception, is always a translation of the word Mizraim. Um, example, at the burial of Jacob, the Canaanites observed the mourning of the Egyptians and so called the place Abel Mizraim. And you can see that in Genesis 50 11. Yeah, Canaan is also a familiar name, isn't it? Many, of course, if you're familiar with your Bible, you recognize the name Canaan. It's the Hebrew name for the region later called by the Romans, Palestine. It's, it's modern day Israel and Jordan. Now, from Canaan came Sidon, the founder of that ancient city that still bears that name. It's an exact, it's still the name Sidon. And uh, that's an example of where it bears exactly the same name as one of the descendants of Noah. Now, in, in, in other cases, a nation or region will be a variation on one of the names of Noah. For example, Heth 
was one of the sons of Canaan, so grandson of Noah, and, uh, and, and was the patriarch of the Hittite nation. So you have Heth and the Hittites. But certainly that can be traced back to Heth. Right. Linguists can follow that. Yeah, lineage. follow that back to, back to Noah, yeah. ultimately. Uh, Meshech is the uh, ancient name for Moscow. Yes. And to this day, one section, the uh, Meshera Lowland, still carries the name of Meshech, virtually unchanged uh, since it or originated. Uh, in other cases, uh, history records the name, you know, changes or, or we get translations into other languages. But uh, here, in, in this case, it's a, it's a perfect um, match. Yes, we could say. Yes, and it, we can look at an example of exactly that, where the translation has changed the name. Uh, one of Noah's uh, great grandsons is Ashkenaz. He's the, the the son of Gomer, which is a grandson of Noah. Right. And the translation of Ashkenaz in, uh, or Ashkenaz into German is is Germany. Right. So that's just that's, that's Ashkenaz translated into German is Germany. That's so again. There's these names that have been imprinted on the ancient world and just testify to the extreme accuracy of the table of nations that you see there in your Bibles in Genesis 10. Right. And, and we, we have that there. It's just, just wonderful to have that confirmation from these looking at ancient nations, the, the names of things, and so on, and seeing that just line up beautifully with what the right. Bible says in Genesis. You know, we understand not everybody is going to uh, trust the scripture uh, like we do, et cetera, you know, and then they need to spend some time investigating things and stuff. But, you know, to be honest from some, some you know, very what I would consider low-level critics of the Bible, atheists, etc. Sometimes you go on YouTube and you see these Using people. Using nice names, right? Low-level critics. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. You know, ranting and stuff like that. You just hear ridiculous things like, well, yes. the Bible is just a fairy tale. It's just a made-up, you know, book and blah, blah, blah. It's like people don't even realize the amount of history they would have to jettison. I'm, I'm talking real history from historians. Uh, you know, even many Bible critics that don't sure. believe the Bible say, look, the Bible is one of the most accurate uh, historical books that we have. It's a, it's a great record of history, and, and, yeah. and we can trust it in so many different areas. So, uh, really, it's just great support for Christians to know that real history backs up, uh, you know, the history in the Bible and, and outside of it as well, that we can trust the Word. Right. What is something that computers and humans have in common, which constantly needs upgrading in computers, but not in humans? The answer is software. You may not have realized you have software, but inside the nucleus of each of your cells, a program is written in the form of 3 billion DNA letters. Intelligent programmers write computer software, but what about living things? Evolutionists tell us that the information in the first living cell just appeared by itself with no intelligent input required. But is that possible? The answer is a resounding no. Even one of Australia's best-known scientists, Paul Davies, conceded that there is no known law of physics able to create information from nothing. And perhaps that's why, in a New Scientist article, he lamented, how did stupid atoms spontaneously write their own software? Nobody knows. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. Our subject today is uh, how and when did the different nations and cultures begin? We've looked at a lot of history there. Yes. Uh, some people are really into history, and uh, and if you've enjoyed uh, some of the things we've been talking about as far as you know Noah's grandsons and where they spread out and stuff like that, got a great article on the website, The 16 Grandsons of Noah, and you can uh, check that out at creation.com slash grandsons. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, look into th that area. Well, let's continue. Um, you know, if, if the Bible's real history, if the Tower of Babel is a, re a real event, if people groups spread out from one area, uh, we should have evidence of that. And actually, we do. Uh, interesting when you look at some of the Chinese characters, right? You, you know, uh, obviously, the, the written language is, is written up of symbols. Each symbol uh, means certain things. And if you make combinations of certain symbols to make larger symbols, they often have, you have different words, different words yeah, and well, different well. meanings, etc. And we're going to show several modern uh, Chinese characters that show the, uh, the ancient Chinese actually knew the gospel. Uh, found in the book of Genesis. and, and so amazing. Yeah, we'll look in uh, this, this book, Oracle Bones Speak. Uh, you can see hundreds of examples like this. Uh, the, the book, you can find it at creation.com, at, at the resource uh, area. But uh, let's look at this. Okay, so we're looking at the word for um, uh, boat. boat here. Okay, now it's made up of three separate uh, other um, gra uh, graphics here. One is a vessel. Uh, one is the number eight, and one is people. 
the, the, question, the question that arises is, why would the word boat be composed of those <laughs> of, other smaller words? Of eight people what? on a boat. Why, why is it, you know, a large boat? And, and so we look at Genesis 6, 9, it says, you know, eight people survived the flood uh, on this boat. Yeah, why would that be, you know, that's... Yeah. Pretty, pretty arbitrary in a sense, right? Kind of like the history of Genesis is built in to the, to the word large boat. And that's referring yeah. to more of a Why large boat. Why would the number boat? eight be there? Well, yes. Noah's three sons and their wives, right? Hmm. Uh, look at, let's look at this uh, word for to covet or desire. Well, here we have the symbol for two trees plus a woman. And that equals to covet or desire. Again, you've got to ask the question, why would two trees plus a woman equal the word to covet. Right. Why isn't it two gold or two diamond rings plus woman oh, yeah, equals okay. covet desire? Well, why isn't it something else? Why is it two trees? All right. Well, Genesis 3, uh, 6 says, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, well, she, she coveted it, was it right? She, coveting, yeah. yeah, like that. Okay. Well, let's look at another one. How about the uh, word forbidden uh, to warn? Well, here again, we have the two trees, which is, again, uh, see, it would be enough of a co coincidence the first time, but, but to have two trees again that symbolize something like yeah, this, and yeah. then God, that's the word for, for uh, forbidden or to warn. Well, Genesis 2, 16, 17, uh, says, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you sh eat of it you shall surely die. It's uh, forbidden. It's forbidden, <laughs> and there was a, a warning there. Again, why would two trees have anything to do with that? Uh, fascinating information. Uh, you can check out on an article on our website called Chinese Characters and Genesis, and you can find that at creation.com slash characters. Another thing we can think about is where are all the people? That's a question we can ask. Where are all the people? The current growth rate of, of the world's population is about 1.1% 1, 1 .1 per year. In other words, for every 100 million people, 1.1 are added, 1.1 million are added every year. Right. That's a basic math. So it takes less than half a percent to get from the flood to 7 billion people. Right. And today's growth rate is 1.1%. So it, it, we don't have to have elevated growth rates in, in, in this supposedly shortened time scale from the flood to now. How, how can we get 7 billion people? We can get it quite easily. All you need is half a percent. Right. And we have more than that right now. Exactly. And there's, there's more detail. Go to creation.com slash people for more of the math and the, and the calculations on that. Yep. Uh, Egyptian history fits biblical uh, history. Yes. You know, for years, the popular media has mocked uh, the biblical accounts of Joseph, Joseph and Moses and the Passover and the Exodus. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's completely incompatible with uh, Egyptian chronology. But year after year, we've been told uh, that these uh, I events in the books of Genesis and Exodus, well, they're nice legends, but they're, they're a void of any historical or archaeological context, right? Um, of course, that's changing. Scholars uh, with diverse backgrounds are, are, are calling uh, for a drastic reduction in the Egyptian chronology. Uh, substantial amounts of evidence uh, to, to show, no, that this actually lines up with what the Bible says from modern scholars. So, great evidence so that you can trust the Bible, and we'll be back shortly. Creation Ministries International edifies the body of Christ by providing more than 30 years of Bible-supporting scientific research delivered through speaking engagements, books, magazines, and a variety of media, much of which is archived on our website, creation.com. Did you know that if you read three articles on creation.com each day, it would take over seven years to read them all? Such a wealth of information didn't arise by chance, however. We do this through the faithful prayers and gifts of our supporters, which also fund ongoing research. Support the building up of the church by partnering with CMI. Donate today at creation.com slash donate. Welcome back. We're going to look at some feedback that we uh, receive every now and then. Yes. And uh, this is from uh, a Christian. And uh, the article was called Handling Aggressive Atheists. You can check that out for the full blow-by-blow uh, -blow account. But we just want to go over this here. I think this is a great, uh, a great topic to, to cover well, with people. A lot of Christians are, are having to deal with aggressive atheists nowadays and, right. and, and getting, getting beaten down. So here's, That's some, right. here's some encouragement for you. Yeah. So he said, as a Christian, I find sharing the gospel very difficult. Not in that I don't know how, but in how do you respond to atheists who angrily attack Christianity. I'm finding no one can have a normal discussion. Maybe you can touch on this point uh, to, to an article uh, that addresses this. Um, I just want to make one comment before we, we go here. I don't find in person, I find a lot of That's angry 
uh, you know, aggressive atheist. Yes. Uh, you know, in yes. person, you're looking at the person's eyes. They're looking at you. You can see the body language. I, I've very rarely had someone just, you know, yeah. go nuclear on me, uh, whether <laughs> even if I'm out presenting or something like that, because, you, you know, but I find it, you know, it's kind of like being in your car. You're driving down the 401. Somehow people think that because they're in their little bubble world, they can be rude and throw gestures at you and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And then you both pull into the same gas station and you both step out and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just, and, and I find the internet's very much like that. The because internet seems it, to bring out the worst in people, doesn't it? Yes, yeah. and, and people aren't seeing people face to face. It's it's dehumanizing in the sense. And so that's usually where you find it. So, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. so one of our new speakers, Keaton, uh, Keaton Haley responded to this. Yeah. Uh, he gives, he lists five points here and we can just uh, uh, read these as he wrote them. He did a good job. Consider, number one, consider yourself blessed and rejoice that you are enduring hardship, even if it is a minor hardship, as being mocked for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. And if you want to look at 1 Peter 4, 13 and 14, your reward is in heaven. In Matthew 5, 11 and 12, it talks about laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. Right. And in that 1 Peter passage, it says that uh, uh, if, if you're attacked for sharing Christ, you are storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven, yeah. so rejoice. So you might want to ask them to do it some more. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe not. <laughs> no, maybe not. Uh, point number two, don't respond in kind since we are not to return evil for evil, 1 Peter 3, 9, but to keep a clear conscience, 1 Peter 3, 16. Uh, we should not answer a foolish person by adopting his bad behavior or wrong way of thinking, Proverbs 26, uh, 4. And uh, see the article, Don't Answer, Do Answer. It'll give you more information on that. Um, sometimes you need directness, you need strong words. Um, but remember that a, a soft answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15, 1. Doesn't mean you, you don't stand up for yourself uh, and don't take heat in a sense, but don't be a green, uh, mean and aggressive back. It's not what we're called yeah, to do. Know how to respond. Uh, number three, if you can, if you can tell that you're wasting your breath on somebody who's only interested in mocking rather than pursuing, that rather than pursuing truth, move on. Yeah. And, and have a look at Matthew 7, verse 6 for that. Uh, you might explain to your critic that there's no point in continuing the discussion unless he's willing to dial back the emotions and really listen. And uh, when, when it's your turn to speak, that they really lessen, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Or that they actually, if you're linking to articles on creation.com, that you insist that they read them b before coming back and commenting right. again. I, I've, I've just found an interesting phenomenon that there are some people out there that seem to have a massive amount of free time to just sit there and mock <laughs> Christians. Do they have jobs or anything? Yeah. Anyway, uh, be prepared to gently and respectively, uh, respectfully defend your Christian convictions. Yeah, I mean, you have to know your Bible, right? Don't say the wrong thing. Know the common objections, things like that. Uh, yes, yeah, basic advice. Yeah. And number five, remember that it isn't your job to convert atheists. <laughs> That's God's job. Right. Come on, come on back next week, same time, same channel, for more from Creation Magazine Live.